Hi everyone, uh, I'm Radu. Uh, I, as, as it was said, I'm a container enthusiast. And when, uh, when it was told me that I have to do a presentation on gaming, they told me, okay, you, weren't, you won't be able to talk about containers. And I said, challenge accepted. I'm really gonna talk about containers as well in this presentation. If you're not familiar with containers and uh, orchestra orchestrators and things like that, we will uh, scratch the surface a little. Uh, just a little about myself, not, no, nothing more than it was uh, said so far. I'm a container enthusiast and open source developer. And uh, I'm a very casual gamer. I, don't, I cannot say about myself that, I, uh, that I'm a gamer. I sometimes play FIFA on my Xbox, but other than that, not that much. Uh, I used to play Wolfenstein back, I think, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, on my 50 megahertz Pentium 1 computer. And it was really cool. First time I discovered it, it blew my mind. But uh, fast forwarding to 2016. Uh, 2016 was the first year when mobile gaming was, uh, was a bigger market than PC gaming. And I think that's a trend that's going to uh, keep and is going to uh, get uh, even much higher in the next few years. And uh, the, the reason why I want to talk about uh, uh, in the next few minutes is how to build a game and how to scale your services in a way that it can reach a broader audience, a global audience. And be before I do that, I, uh, this, this is a slide that it's really fun to show to customers because uh, a data center in, in the Azure is the size of a football size, a football field, uh, where you can fit two jumbo jets. And there are around 16 uh, that buildings in one Azure region. That sums up to 600,000 servers. And there are 42 regions. So when I say that you will be able to reach a broad audience to a scale, to, to a global scale, I really mean it. Even if you have customers in South Africa, or even if you have customers in China or Brazil or uh, Western Europe, you can reach your customers with uh, lowest latency and best geo redundancy. And this is a list of things that I, and not, not me, uh, the gaming team in Microsoft thinks that you need for your games. First of all would be geo coverage in terms of latency, redundancy. The next would be for you to be able to continue to use your development environment that you already use and you're familiar with. And another would be advanced analytics to know how your users are actually playing the game. And what I'll try to do in two minutes, I'll try to uh, briefly talk about each one of them. So in terms of geo coverage, as I said, there are 42 regions in, uh, in Azure. And for each service that you want to use, even if it's storage or virtual machines or containers or whatever, sto whatever uh, service you want to use, you can test the individual service for latency. You can select the data center and you can actually test for uh, what's the latency for my specific service uh, when I'm in Brazil or when I'm in Japan. In terms of reliability, as you would expect from any, from any uh, cloud provider, you will be able to use, if, if you develop your games using either Unity or Unreal or any gaming engine, you will be able to do it. In terms of advanced analytics, how many of you, by show of hands, have very clear understanding of how your games are actually played? And how when your users hit a box on, or when stuff happens in your game? Okay, and uh, for those that don't have, uh, why is the reason behind that? Is, is it a uh, sort of implementing that in your game or understanding what to do with your data? The idea is that uh, by keep to keep your existing backend, not to modify anything in your in your game, and to be able to have those insights from your from your application. So, uh, on a screen is a very uh, not that simple architecture of uh, analytics for your game, and the idea is that uh, no matter what game client you have, even if it's a console or a phone or a tablet. Uh, you have events, and then you have a huge engine that's capable of scaling to millions of events. So in, when I say event, I mean an event that happens in your game. So when a player dies or 
ups a level or gets a coin or things like that. So what you need to do is to have a, uh, if, you, if you need that and if you want to have live interactions with your players, so whenever they have three levels up in a row in the past five minutes, you want to send a message or a prize or things like that, you need a service like Spark or Kafka that is able to get real-time messages. You can deploy those in Azure. You can deploy them in a couple of minutes. Or you can use some already existing services that you don't manage. Just uh, hit, some, hit them their endpoint with traffic, with data. And then you can have some SQL-like queries for rolling, up, for rolling windows or for things like that. So whenever uh, something happens with your uh, users, you can process the data in real time. And then you can have, uh, you can store them in blob storage or visualize them with any uh, capable client of, of doing so. So uh, without any, I, I'm going to uh, demo a, a Mario level. And we're going to get some uh, insights about what happens in our game and when some exceptions are caught and things like that. So the the idea is that uh, this is this is a sample from GitHub. I found it on on a on an account. I didn't do anything to it other than uh, okay, I just died. Other than adding some calls to the uh, application insights endpoint, that's the service from uh, from Azure that deals with uh, application telemetry and logs. Other than adding two method calls to send data, I, I didn't modify the game. I didn't do anything. So I'll try to I'll try not to die. Okay. There, there's a reason why, if, if you pay attention in the back, you can see some logs from Application Insights. Okay, so whenever there's, a, there's an event happening, you can, you can see the application logs that's sending to Application Insights. And uh, one, more, one more thing in the game. And uh, stuff happens. I've just hit an exception in the game. And for you as game developers, uh, there are. Th this is the thing that I as a user uh, can see in the game. F and for you as developers, there's no very clear way other than the user submitting a rage, re rage review on the App Store to know what actually happened. So uh, let's see how we can uh, see the data. From that, so as I said, the, the service is called uh, Application Insights. You can use it from uh, basically anywhere you can make a, a, an HTTP request. And and uh, in near real time, there's a delay of almost one minute, 50, 60 seconds or so. Uh, you can have uh, very SQL-like uh, queries for your, for your data. So for example, let's see all events that happened in the last uh, 24 hours. OK, so. Uh, you can see, uh, besides the uh, message itself, the event itself, that Mario had a short, short but meaningful career, meaning that I died. You can see information about the client regarding their device that they're using, uh, their IP address, their location, uh, application name, and and other things like that. Besides that, what you could have, if you if your game does external dependencies to other services. You can actually count those here, and you can see for every request in your game when what happened. Uh, 
what resources were consumed on the device. So these are infor uh, information that uh, that are, I think, valuable for information. But other than that, there, there are other types of information when the client died, where the application encountered an exception. And you can actually see the entire the entire trace call for your for your application. Okay, so uh, at any given point in time, you can see what the client did, what was happening when an exception occurred, how many levels they upped in the last five minutes in real time. Okay, now the presentation and the title contains the name containers. So by show of hands, who's familiar with Linux containers? Okay, I'm gonna be extremely brief with this. A container means to bundle an application with its dependencies and its configuration into a single deployable package that you can then start on any server that supports containerization. So that means that you can take your application have a, an image out of it and then deploy it on your data center in any cloud and have portability between those. So uh, the idea behind containers and I see uh, extremely, uh, a lot of times the, uh, that uh, a container is a lightweight virtual machine, that's not exactly accurate. So while a virtual machine is hardware virtualization in which each VM thinks has its own infrastructure, its own RAM, its own CPU, the container is operating system virtualization. So every container thinks it's, it has its own uh, clean operating system. So uh, the idea behind is that a virtual machine has around 10, 15 gigabytes in size, depending on what you have inside. While a container, it can start from five megabytes to a couple of hundreds of megabytes, again, depending on what's inside. So why would I use containers? Well, first of all, would be repeatable execution. I know I would have the uh, consistency across all my uh, environments. I can have portability between on-premises and the cloud, between different cloud providers. I can have hybrid applications that run part on cloud, part on my infrastructure. And uh, the idea is that uh, when preparing some of the demos, uh, I had to install Unity. One of the uh, demos from a couple of minutes uh, later is gonna be built using Unity. And I had to create a special virtual machine for it. I had to install Unity. I had to update that. I had to have all required dependencies for Unity. And the idea is that if I have five environments for it, I need to configure five virtual machines. And the idea behind using a cloud and behind using your own infrastructure is to use it smartly. You can have Chef or Puppet or Ansible do that automatically for you, but again, you're still using virtual machines. And I'll come back to it in a moment. Uh, a discussion that's uh, very good to have when discussing container is that is that about orchestrators. So what orchestration does for you is it allows you to see your data center as a pool of resources. So if you have ten virtual, if you have ten servers with five cores each, you have fifty cores. You, you see your entire data center as a unit, as a as a single unit. It's easy to scale your applications up and down. It's easy to scale your infrastructure up and down. So, uh, one of the most used orchestrator is Kubernetes. It came from an open source project started at Google. And the idea behind it is, uh, is very simple. It, as I said, you see your, your infrastructure as a unitary thing. And you can deploy application and not specify a single node, but a shared pool of resources. So, uh, the idea is that it makes deploying applications much easier. So when you have your application that consists of 20 containers, so for example, you have a container for your leader leaderboard service, you have a container for your game server, you have a container for some real-time notifications. Uh, the idea is that you don't want to start those manually. You don't have, you don't want to uh, look, okay, is my container up or is it down? Do I have to restart it? On what server do I start my container? 
how do I deal with uh, DNS or service discovery. So these are all these things are all things that Kubernetes does for you. So you specify a simple file, and I'll I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so uh, as I as it was in the slide, I'm gonna deploy a Minecraft server on Kubernetes. So the idea is that I only need to. I need to specify it only a Docker image, and that's it. And Kubernetes will automatically deploy it to my to my cluster. So the idea behind it is, even if something happens to that specific node where my container got deployed, I still want my game server to run. So even if you're on premises, or even if you're on some hosted environment, or even if you're in any cloud provider, no matter what happens to my application, to my specific application, even if it's an application error or it's a cloud provider fault, or regardless of what happens, I want my application to run. I, want my, uh, I don't want my users to, uh, to have any sort of, of, uh, of downtime. So this is, uh, this is a very simple Minecraft client. user plays, and I'm going to do something that I will hope to recognize later. Okay, this is the shape that, uh, this is the shape that we hope to recognize later. So what I'm going to do, I'm basically going to shut down the container that's running my game server. I'm just going to, I'm going to simulate the unplugging of the server. So what happens behind the scenes is that uh, the way the Minecraft uh, server is built, when you uh, play and uh, when, when you actually do things in Minecraft, it saves the state to an external source. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that, and we will just uh, delete the the uh, server. Okay, so this is the pod. This is the actual container that is running my server. I'm gonna delete it. And we can see that Kubernetes automatically scheduled another game server for me. I didn't have to do anything. I specified it. I always want one instance to run, no matter what happens, even if the data center is on fire. I want you to schedule me another game server on another node. And uh, that container is going to die soon. And let's see what happens to, uh, to my client. So it's still going to. Uh, it's going to take a, a couple of seconds for that container to be deallocated. But what we hope to happen is when the game server restarts, I want those things to be kept. So depending on your writing to your storage policy, depending on how often you write to the disk, and depending on how often you choose not to, OK, my server just died, uh, you're going to have the most recent updates or the state from two minutes ago when you last saved the state. So you have to, depending on your game, depending on how often state changes in your game, you won't have a balance between writing to external sources and uh, and actually maintaining the the state. So the idea behind it is that I want my game to be automatically updated. I want it to be uh, always have updates for my clients and for them not to update the game manually. And the, the idea is of that of gaming as a service. And first of all, I want to continuously update and improve my game. And the second, that it's not that, uh, that it's only scratching the surface right now, it's called cloud streaming. So the idea is that I'm, uh, my device, my laptop cannot run games, but I still want to play games. So I want to do all the crunching, all the graphics processing on some servers maybe in the cloud so I don't have to buy my infrastructure, I don't have to buy my Pascal GPUs or my Tesla GPUs. And I want everything to, uh, to be rendered in the cloud and then to be streamed to me either as video or as some binary format to my Mac or to my phone or to my anything. So let's see if I can, what, what happened here? Provided I'm still connected to the internet. 
which I'm not exactly sure I still am. Okay, I should be though. Okay, Wh while I uh, try to fix this, uh, I'd like to ask for questions. Raise your hand and I will come uh, with the mic to you. Okay, I'm definitely, the connection just broke. Uh, by the way, questions are m mandatory, so if there is no escape. Okay, so while uh, while that tries to connect, the the idea behind it is to have a, a, a service that I don't have to manually update the, the infrastructure behind it. Me as a developer, I just improve the game, I add new levels, I do stuff, and the user automatically gets it. So uh, I can give you some reference for some architectures for using Kubernetes for game servers. The, uh, the idea is that you deploy your infrastructure once, and then automatically, uh, based on your CI CD infrastructure, even if it's Jenkins or GitLab or whatever uh, CI CD you have, in the end, you need to uh, your game to be uh, automatically updated. And for the cloud streaming and for gaming as a service, we can talk about the uh, graphics processing and how to actually use Kubernetes with those uh, with those GPUs in uh, in the cloud. So any any sort of question regarding cloud computing or Kubernetes for game servers? Okay. Okay, so, so the question was how do I manage different versions of the server that are not uh, backward compatible with the client? So what, uh, what Kubernetes does for you is you can have rolling updates and you can have rollbacks in case of failures. So what you can have, you can have different namespaces, so different sandboxes for V1 and V2. And then once your clients all get updated, you just remove the v V1. And it, it does that with no downtime. It does it automatically for you with no downtime. It also supports UDP if you don't want HTTP. It supports directly connecting to the IP of the port if you don't have, if you don't want to have latency between a reverse proxy or a load balancer and your actual game server. And uh, before we stop, I, I want to uh, have just one minute to talk about the uh, virtual reality things that are going with Windows. And I'm going to let Laura just uh, tell you about it, and you can discuss with her later. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Laura Savu. I'm a, a colleague with uh, Radu. I'm working for Microsoft. I'm an engineer in Windows Sub Consult team, and uh, we are helping developers that make applications and publish them in Windows Store. And the big part of these applications uh, are the games. Uh, so I don't have any slides. I want to show you the uh, Acer device headset. It's here, and uh, those of you that have application virtual reality applications and want to port those applications which are already running, for example, on Oculus Rift or HTC Vive, they can do it with uh, easily with uh, Unity, with the last version of Unity, uh, actually with the version which is uh, right now in beta, with 2017.2. And uh, if uh, you want to, to publish uh, your Windows Store application in Windows application in Windows Store, or if you have technical questions uh, on uh, Windows Mixed Reality, uh, you can contact me. Radu will, uh, will show you my uh, email address. I don't have uh, business cards with me. Uh, and uh, actually, we, Microsoft names uh, the Mixed Reality everything that is... Uh, uh, between uh, virtual reality and augmented reality because uh, there will be a lot of devices uh, starting with uh, this uh, immersive headset uh, to HoloLens. Uh, so if you will have uh, questions, if technical questions, if you are blocked or if uh, you have applications to port, you can contact me or... Uh, I don't know if you already used this. You can... Um, 
you can uh, try it. You can uh, ask for uh, a dev kit like this. Uh, you will receive it. Actually, I already uh, talked with some teams that uh, already received the dev kit. Uh, you just have to provide some information about you and about your project, and Microsoft will ship it to you. Uh, and uh, you will also receive the motion controllers. Uh, and that's all. <laughs> Okay, the question was uh, that streaming services uh, have been tried for many years, for many uh, many times during the years, and it never actually succeeded because of many latency issues and things like that. Uh, what is different this time is that uh, Google, AWS, and Microsoft really have global reaching clouds with very powerful graphics processors. And the idea is that the distance from your from your clients to the nearest data center is much lower than it was five years ago. And it's much lower than it was two years ago and then last year. And the idea is that the uh, actual latency is smaller and smaller. You can actually test it to all major cloud providers. And I think that would be the main thing that stopped gaming streaming services from actually succeeding. You have very powerful graphics processors and low latency. And that's basically what you need. Cool, thank you, Radu. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks.